welcome to How I Killed My Mother and Other Confessions by the Mafia Hairdresser. This podcast is filled with episodes of my true confessions, harrowing, horrifying, and sometimes uplifting stories about my hair clients and celebrity friends, and of course, all about my mom issues. This podcast is brought to you by the demons in my head, the angels who told me I should do this podcast, and all the signed and unsigned permission release forms from everyone I mentioned in this podcast. This is your host, John David, aka The Mafia Hairdresser, author of the novels Mafia Hairdresser and The Glow Stick Gods, and the upcoming book Murder. There's an app for that, all based on my fantastical, crazy life. You can listen to the serial podcast version of Novel 1 and Novel 2 here at The Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles and wherever you listen to Puff. You can listen to the serial podcast version of Novel 1 and Novel 2 here at The Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles and wherever you listen to podcasts. And both the books and the hit podcast, along with this one, How I Killed My Mother, are available at MafiaHairdresser.com. And now on with this episode of How I Killed My Mother. My life is like an old country western song, part one. In the old days, if you lost your old hairstylist or you moved to a new town, you would immediately go on the hunt to find that perfect, talented new person to do your hair. By word of mouth, you would have probably found your local salon, the one with a good reputation, and then you would have called for an appointment. But the problem was that you would invariably be placed in the hands of the newest stylist who didn't have a clientele. You're lucky. They might have had some natural talent and your hair wouldn't be fucked up after your first appointment. And then if you were a patient or a good person or a masochist, you may have stuck with that newbie hairdresser as they learned their craft by experimenting on you along with the other unsuspecting first time clients. Today, if you're looking for a new stylist, all one has to do is type the hashtag of your own town, plus hair, plus hashtag hair color, and hashtag name of town hair on an Instagram search, and you'd get to see videos and pictures of hairdressers as well as their work in the town that you were looking in with the hashtag. The problem with this new and improved social media system for all stylists is that the customers who use IG to find stylists don't stick with those stylists throughout the stylist's career. There is no more loyalty from customers. Even if a customer loved their first visit to a new stylist, the next time they need a color or a fresh cut, that customer will again scroll through IG with those same hashtags for their next service, only this time looking for a new hairdresser who might charge less than the last one. New hairstylists entering the industry face way too competitive pricing, a shitty economy, higher overhead, and a fickle clientele who won't even look up from their phones as the stylists do their hair. There is a lot less human bonding going on between hairdressers and their clients due to our use of cell phones, alerts, and social media addiction. And that is a cry in shame. On the positive side, I believe that a young newbie stylist, well, I believe you're probably all better than my generation of stylists who graduated from cosmetology school because they have experts on YouTube teaching them haircutting and styling and coloring techniques for free. I had to to go to hair seminars and academies and become an expert. I went to Sassoon, Chadwick's, Bumble and Bumble, Paul Mitchell, Sebastian. I've been to all of their academies at great expense. I was in Chicago for the weekend a couple of weeks ago, and I went to dinner with my gal pal Megumi. She's a young woman who I met when she began working straight out of cosmetology school at the salon I worked at in Chicago, Joseph Michaels Salon and Spa. When the uh, salon owner, Paul, told me that she would be working at the station next to mine, I half-jokingly protested by saying how hard it would be for me to work next to a hairdresser hatchling, hacking away on the heads of the walk-in clients she would surely be given to by the front reception desk. Cosmetologically speaking, I had judgy expert eyes. Please don't expect me to help the newbie when one of our more discriminating new clients complains about her lack of skills, I said to Paul, after he said he was going to put Megumi in the styling chair next to mine. 
No, no, I cannot sit by and witness hair molestation on a daily basis, I lamented. You must place her next to someone else, like Gordon. He's old, and his clients are old and blind, and he's just phoning it in until he dies. His eyes are so bad that he won't even notice if she accidentally cuts someone's ear off. And Paul, well, he always took things so seriously, which always make my exaggerated, egomaniacal acts even more funny to me. And like always, I laughed out loud after seeing the horror and the disgust on his face after my humorous, to me, backstab on my new co-worker. I walked away, laughing to myself. And of course, I hazed Megumi on her first day. I had found a cucumber lying around in the break room. So I proudly and too seriously proclaimed that the vegetable was my special welcome gift to her. When Megumi took it out of my hand, her first reaction was to thank me. But my wink that went along with the gift was way too creepy. So she backed away. But in a short time, Megumi caught on to me and we became very good friends. Over the years, I enjoyed watching her become one of the best hairdressers I have ever encountered. She went to more advanced hair academies before YouTube than I ever did. And she's worked alongside some of the top high profile cutters and colorists in the world. And I'm very proud of her. But Megumi's life wasn't easy. She had boyfriends, which we got boyfriend problems. And I'm sure she had dad issues after her parents divorced when she was very young. And she had a mom who borrowed money from her from the day she got her first job. And that woman would have continued to borrow from her, her own daughter, until Megumi was penniless. But Megumi always had this inner strength. And I have been inspired by the way she has, inspired by the way she has maneuvered in her own life. And it was always nice to sit down with her to catch up after the years when we were no longer working side by side together. So I heard I was having dinner with her the other night and she told me that she had received uh, a settlement that she filed against a cabinet company two years prior, which I knew nothing about. Her cab driver ran a curb and smashed into a tree. Now she was wearing a seatbelt and I just want to say, who does that in a cab? But she was injured and she did end up going to work that same day, which in retrospect hurt her case a bit, but her chiropractor backed her up all the way and she got a good chunk of change from the cab company. Because I no longer lived in Chicago at the time, I had been renting out um, Megumi's salon suite one or two days a, a month when I was in town to do my Chicago clients. And I also rented a chair um, quite near four days a week once a month from another one of our co-workers had, who um, opened a salon. So anyway, Megumi used to work seven days a week because she wanted to get out of credit card debt. Um, but when she got her settlement, she completed paying off all her debt and then she put the rest of the money in savings. And then it occurred to her to work in a quality of way of life. So she got down on her hours to five days a week and rented her suite to me two days a month as a result. And she also decided she was going to take herself on vacations once a year. Debts paid, a savings, vacations. I was super happy for her. When it was my turn to update Megumi on my life, I had to begin telling her my cur uh, current, my current bittersweet situation. On this night out together, I also told her that I would no longer be coming to Chicago once a month to do her hair, so I wouldn't need to use her salon suite after the next month. My dogs were tired of the constant traveling by car from Boca Raton, Florida, to Blowing Rock Car from Boca Raton, Florida, to Blowing Rock, North Carolina, to Chicago, and then back again, only to repeat the trip every three months, or every three weeks, sorry. We had been doing this for over two freaking years and I was also over it and my dogs had put their paws down because they were super over it and I told Megumi that my mental state was precarious at best and even though I felt awful that I was going to have to um, tell my Chicago clients that I was going to uh, quit them I had to take care of myself and my dogs and we needed time to heal in one place and make ourselves at home or make ourselves a home where we wouldn't constantly be leaving and coming back to it 
I also told Megumi that I had a podcast called John, David, and Goliath. This podcast is um, just like this one. It's under the auspices of the Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles. Everything's at MafiaHairdresser.com. Anyway, that particular podcast was just me talking about years and why I had kept up with the constant travel. In that popular podcast, I tell my listeners the true crime story about me getting my dream job at the Boca Raton Resort, the five hotel golf and pools and restaurants, resort and spa, and how the management lied to hundreds of us employees, which ruined my hair career, as well as, to an extent, my whole life. I'm just saying, fraudulent contract breaking employers can ruin people's lives. And I'm not saying it really did ruin my life. I'm here, aren't I? So anyway, that podcast also details how I was attempting to sue the Boca Raton LLC for millions of dollars, yada yada, still ongoing. Megumi had seen my past, uh, my post about the podcast on social media, but she hadn't listened to it, nor would I want her to. We are friends. I'd rather just hang out with her on the phone or go out to dinner like we did the few nights ago. And so I could just tell her what was going on in my life. I need and I want friendships and I don't need or want my friends to be my listeners per se, because the podcast about what I went through is just one of the many tools I plan to use when I sue the fuck out of the Boca Raton Resort. My thinking about that podcast was that all I would have to do at this point is um, point out my podcast to the judge and jury and ask, why do you think they haven't sued me? Because it's true. But hey, this is not part of this podcast. If you want to listen to the whole thing, uh, you can listen to John David and Goliath. Just go to MafiaHairdresser.com. Anyway, I told Megumi what happened at the Boca Raton, as well as everything else that had transpired in my life in the past two years. She said, wow, your life is like an old time country song. And she was right. My life was like an old time country western song. So now I'm going to tell you some of the story. So now I'm going to tell you some of the story that I told Megumi. Okay. And maybe it's a sad story and it's full of a few wows, but also way too many. That's too bad. But as bad as my story is, it isn't nearly as devastating as some of the stories I've heard that happened to other people in this past year or years since the pandemic started. Nonetheless, I hope my story will illuminate why I started out this podcast with an episode called Suicide Note and why I have learned to embrace my dark side. I hope it will also illuminate why even when I have been at my lowest and my darkest, I always knew I was going to be okay and that there was always going to be light at the end of my life's tunnels. Like we learn in hair color school, there is only darkness because there is also light. We need both to see clearly in life and in hair color. And you know what? I don't if I had not had my dark period. I'll start out by telling you that in 2020, I lived on the 34th floor of a high-rise building in downtown Chicago, the Gold Coast, and I also rented a salon suite in the next door sister building at 100 East Walton, which became the new Rodeo Drive of Chicago in the six or seven years that I lived there. It was a very Tony location, both to live and to work. When Chicago's Mayor Lightfoot issued the quarantine mandate in March of 2020, I was fortunate in that I moved all of my hair coloring and cutting and styling supplies up to my apartment, which had not been decorated like a normal apartment, a one bedroom apartment, because when I first moved in that apartment after my last relationship breakup, in addition to doing hair, I had been making a second living doing video content and social media consulting, in the, especially in the salon industry, as well as producing, producing my first podcast, The Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles. So instead of a couch, a TV, and a dining table, I had a huge desk complete with two computers and three monitors. In one corner, I had a sound booth for auto recording that was made out of a cardboard life-size British phone booth that looked so cool. And I also had a meeting table, uh, multiple cameras on tripods, and uh, modular lighting, uh, a modular lighting kit complete with backdrops. And we went into lockdown. It was easy to convert my 
my one bedroom social media office apartment into a salon. Everything was a hard surface, like in a regular salon, so everything could be sanitized and disinfected between customers. Of course, it would have been illegal for me to do hair in my apartment, but I could not afford to miss a beat where it concerned my hand-to-mouth income. Save for a few, most of my clients were more than comfortable coming to get their hair done in my apartment, but I would have to meet them down in my apartment's lobby, escort them up to my apartment to do their hair, and then escort them down when their appointment was over. This was what we all had to do when receiving visitors when one lived in a high-rise during the uh, lockdown. Um, And it was on a Saturday, May 30th of 2020, that I had just finished coloring the roots and highlighting the hair of a mother and daughter. I had known both women for over 25 years. Marty, the mom, was a psychologist who lived three hours away in Michigan, but she always came into the city to get her hair done by me. And Betsy, Marty, Marty's daughter, was a grown professional working woman who had a grade school son and a great husband. And Betsy lived just south of me over the river in an area called The Loop, and I was privileged to do Betsy's hair for her wedding. Also with us was Rick, Marty's husband, Betsy's dad, and Rick had a brace on his leg. Dad, and Rick had a brace on his leg from an unfortunate accident due to his unwise decision to mow his slopey rolling lawn on his sit-down mower after a rain. His Alzheimer's, a recent diagnosis, had surely had something to do with the rain mowing on a hill accident. And that day, I also cut Rick's hair. Anyway, beginning May 28th to May 30th, the day that I did the family's hair, Chicago had been the host to a few protests regarding the trial of George Floyd's murder. There were a few violent altercations, but mostly uh, there were peaceful marches and demonstrations with streets and roads only blocked off. And there were police, lots and lots of police and policing. I use that in quotation marks. But all of that was happening in other neighborhoods in Chicago, not in the Gold Coast where I lived. And none of us living and working in in lots of police and policing would ever roll into our neighborhood. And by the time May 30th rolled around, it seemed as if the most newsworthy protests, scuffles, minor violence, and road closure interruptions were quieting down. So when Marty, Betsy, and Rick and me watched the Floyd trial protesters and Black Lives Matter marches uh, block and walk up and down Michigan Avenue, as seen from my apartment on the 34th floor, as I did their hair, we thought it was a good sign. We all empathized with the protesters as best and as woke as we were at that time, and we also thought that seeing the marchers in the neighborhood was a sign that the violence we had only heard about must be dying down. Surely, if marchers and protesters were in the Gold Coast, of course it was going to be a peaceful march. What we did not know was how much the protesters were being harassed by police, and we didn't know that violence and, and we didn't know that violence and looting had already begun just south of us that had nothing to do with the protesters. We didn't know that organized gangs, and I'll use that in quotation marks, who had previously decided to piggyback onto the protests and marchers. Gangs had given pre-assigned jobs to volunteers to walk into the shops in the Gold Coast of Chicago, pinpoint and make note of specific, specific merchandise. And then on May 30th, other volunteers would break into those stores, take the pre-targeted, pre-shopped merchandise, and then turn it over to gang members at specific locations where cars and small trucks would be stationed to cart the merchandise away. Those same gang organizers were also chirping on social media, whipping up ideas of violence and chaos and looting Unbeknownst to me and the family whose hair I was doing, the city of Chicago had already opened whose hair I was doing, the city of Chicago had already opened the bridges, so no one in my neighbor in my neighborhood could cross the river to get to the south, which is called the loop. The lake was directly to the east of us, and only ten blocks way west of us, the police had already barricaded the streets and the roads, and we were also cut off due north. No one could enter the downtown Gold Coast area about three blocks north, and no one could get out unless on foot. 
after what felt like a very long day do, doing Marty and Betsy's and um, Rick's hair as they enjoyed their wines and cheeses and crackers that they brought, while I had to wear a mask and I got hungry and hungrier, they were having a great time and I'm happy for it. I was more than happy to escort them down, though, in the elevator after they were done and watch them be taken away in a Lyft or an Uber. <sighs> but as the four of us in mass rode the elevator down to my lobby, Betsy seemed Betsy seemed very perturbed. She said, I can't seem to get a Lyft or an Uber on my apps. And she was just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling her in her smartphone. Maybe it's just because one of the Black Lives Matter marches or something, I said. Too many people using the cell towers. Once we're downstairs, we'll probably just hail a cab. So once on the street level of my building, I, I sat Rick and Marty down in the chairs in my lobby while Betsy and I continued to fill. Uh, she fiddled with her app and I stepped out of my building and searched for a cab. But there were no cabs. In fact, there were no cars driving around at all. There was just a steady stream of people walking north and not just on the sidewalks, but on the vehicle Miracle Mile streets of Chicago. After giving up hope for a cab, I came back to my building where Betsy was now standing outside with her parents while she repeatedly connected with a Lyft and Uber, Uber drivers after, and they just, it just rotated and they kept on picking her up and suddenly directly to the west of us, a small compact car raced down Wall Street the wrong way on a one way. Then the car rammed into the north entrance revolving door of Bloomingdale's, which was right across the street from us. Almost immediately, about a hundred or more people came rushing out of the alley up the street towards us. And they immediately began focusing on trying to get into Bloomingdale's across the street. Unfortunately for the crowd, the compact car had not created an opening in the closed door. The car had only managed to get wedged in the revolving door, and the crowd of wannabe looters were confused. I know that the first thing one might ask is, how did you feel when all that happened? Or what was going through your mind at that moment? But you know what? I couldn't tell you that because although I can remember the moments and seconds after the looting started all around us, all I could think of was, I am so hungry. And now I guess. But I did not immediately feel fear. That came much later. Of course, when I realized that my guests were just about to be freaking out, I ushered Betsy, Mar Marty, and Rick back into my apartment building where the doorman locked the front door behind us and turned off the lobby lights. The sun was only just starting to go down at that time. In the elevator on our way up back to my apartment, I realized that Rick was just totally and utterly bemused and angry. He was hungry too, and Marty, like me, had gone into action mode, devoid of hysteria. Betsy could only think about her husband and her son. She wanted to get home to them as soon as possible, and she was in mom mode. I want to go home, Rick exclaimed. I'm bored. What's for dinner? Dad, screamed a frantic Be Betsy. Please be quiet for a minute. I'm calling this Uber driver. We're going to go home, dear, soothed Marty. We just have to stop by JD's apartment to go. Can't we just go home, Rick lamented. I have fresh sheets on my bed, I whispered to Marty. Me and Betsy can sleep on arrow beds in the living room. I don't think we should be out on the streets. I'm going home, said Betsy. I have to get home. Before the looting began, Betsy had called her family. Her husband had ordered takeout and it had already arrived and he and his son were waiting for mommy and grandma and grandpa to come home. But Betsy's husband had not yet experienced the looting that was only minutes away from where he was. The Loop neighborhood got hit 20 minutes after Betsy hung up. Once we got into my apartment, we looked out the windows and down to the streets below. There was a constant flow of people walking north on Michigan Avenue. Directly below us on Walton, we saw police running on foot after the looters who couldn't get into Bloomingdale's because the idiot driving the crash car drove it in. We saw police running on foot after the looters who couldn't get into Bloomingdale's because the idiot driving the crash car drove it into the impenetrable revolving door. What the amateur thief should have done was ram the stolen car into one of the two walls of windows on either side of the revolving door. That would have opened a very large portal into the store so that the waiting looters in the alley could have retrieved their predetermined chosen merchandise from the closed store. 
I really thought we should have laid low until the next day when things blew over with whatever was happening on the street at the moment down below us. I tried to convince Marty and Rick that they could sleep on my bed that night and that I had two arrow beds for Betsy and me. Plus, I had plenty of food in the fridge and I was hungry. By the time I finished making that offer, I had already gone to my Twitter app and I had seen some of what was going on in the south of us and the west of us. People throwing rocks through windows of major department stores, looting, small fires, and husband and her son were. Neither I nor Marty could convince her that staying home at my apartment was the best and safest thing that we could do. And then Betsy secured a Lyft driver. She began communicating with him in her Lyft app, and he promised to wait for her if she walked the four blocks north where he had been traveling south only to encounter a roadblock. So I came up with a plan to go down um, the service elevator in my building where the four of us uh, would exit my building into the northern alley, walk through the service tunnel of the neighboring building, and then continue the four blocks north to get the family to the waiting Lyft driver. But the looters had already begun smashing windows and looting the stores on Oak Street. Oak Street was the very street we had begun to cross to get to Inner Lakeshore Drive to walk north. And we didn't fully realize what was going on until we were in the middle of the street. People were running past the middle of the street. People were running past us, some with piles of designer clothes or boxes of, of expensive jewelry in their hands, some just empty handed and running. Why are all these people on the street? Rick, Rick demanded as he limped through the crowd. My leg hurts. We should turn back, screamed Marty. We can't, I said while holding Rick steadily while rushing him through the crowd of the looters. The door of the back of the building locked when we left. I avoided eye contact with the looters carrying boxes of Hermes scarves and boxes of Rolex watches or Jimmy Choo shoes. I'm going to run ahead to make sure the Lyft driver doesn't leave, said Betsy. So we let her run on. And I said, okay, I think. But there was no turning back anyway. We were already halfway through the hive of looters. The alley we came through behind us had become a major thoroughfare for the looters. The looters were not at all interested for the looters. The looters were not at all interested in us anyways, in retrospect. They had a job to do. As we walked the three blocks north to the waiting lift driver, we walked past where the police had previously erected a barricade, and we seemed to be one of the few last of the beleaguered and bewildered walkers who had just come from the Gold Coast. Everyone, including my group, was in shock, having just witnessed the violent force and fervor used to deface and rob the downtown Gold Coast businesses. We passed lines of stuck and stopped cars facing south. Some of the drivers were outside their parked cars and asking some of us walking what was going on. And there were CTA buses full of passengers still waiting to move. It would have been a long time that they would have to wait until they reached their destinations if they wanted to go where they were heading. Betsy's Lyft driver was conveniently not boxed in by the stopped traffic around him. So when I ushered the family into conveniently not boxed in by the stopped traffic around him. So when I ushered the family into his car, he easily swung a Yui and then headed north away from the retail purge event that was taking place in my neighborhood. And later that night, when Betsy called me, she said that the Lyft driver had to drive as far north as Wrigleyville and then way west. And then he had to swing around south to get her safely back to her family at her apartment in the loop. It took over two hours for her to get home. Normally a 20 minute walk or a 10 minute drive. By the time they got to Betsy's apartment, the looting in her neighborhood had started and ceased and it was all quiet. If not still a mess of broken glass, broken down thresholds, trash and discarded merch spewed into the streets around her neighborhood. And by the way, I just called Marty yesterday because I was reminiscing about this and I I don't think I ever heard the full story from her, but she got at Betsy's house. They got back down to the car and an ATM had been ripped apart, uh, ripped from the walls of a bank and broken and on top of her car. She didn't notice it till they tried to get to, into their car to go to their hotel. So Betsy walked them to their hotel and walked back. Still the looting still going on a little bit. 
And Betsy, super brave. And the next day, they they witnessed fires and lobbies and the whole bit in the loop. The loop really got hit bad. So I'm I'm thankful that I got to talk to Marty and we reminisce and talk about our PPSD. But um, I I I love her very much and we still talk about it. And um, anyway, so I thought I would mention it. So anyway, after I dropped off Betsy and her family and they had sped away in the lift, I suddenly felt super alone because I was. The significance and the danger and the unknown of what was happening in my neighborhood, of what was happening in my neighborhood was beginning to sink in. In my hindsight, thought of how I should have insisted that my client stayed at my apartment until we knew exactly what was going on and how much danger we could have been in crossed my mind. And I did not look forward to walking back to my apartment. And I just felt that if something happened to me along the way, I should at least let someone know where I was and what I was doing. So I called my friends, Aaron, Sue, and Tina. They were at our friend, Mary Lou's. And that was just a little north and west of where I was currently. And I talked to the ladies the entire time I was walking back home. And I I narrated what I saw as I passed Oak Street. And I walked back to my apartment uh, the way we came, only passing one or two stragglers, north north walkers on the way. But by the time I got back to Oak Street, the whole street had been police taped and barricaded, and there were no signs of life. No looters, no people, and no police. Just trash and debris, and debris devastation everywhere. And instead of going through Oak Street and through the alley from which I came, I stayed on Michigan Avenue and I rounded the corner to my own street, Walton Street. It was eerily quiet there. No one was in sight. But unlike Oak Street, there was no trash on the street or sidewalk. Up ahead, I could still see the small car wedged in the ornate yet mangled revolving door of Bloomingdale's, a door, I later found out, that was very expensive and expensive and had originally come from and had to be replaced and imported by a European company. So on the phone, I regaled to my friends how everything seemed like a zombie apocalypse movie. Only there were no live or dead people or zombies running away trying to eat me or lying in and adamantly on the streets. There was just trash and glass from broken windows. And my street was just, you know, zombie-less. As I didn't know that the police had opened the bridges so no one could get in or out south of the Gold Coast, and I didn't know that the police had already barricaded any driving exits west of me and north of me. But my friends I was still on the phone with also didn't know that the police net was also dropping around them. I found out the next day that the girls couldn't get out of Mary Lou's neighborhood until the wee hours of that night. To my friends on the phone, I narrated in real time what I had seen and what I was seeing with my, uh, with increasing humor and hyperbole leading up to the minutes when I arrived at my apartment building. I mean, I was just being funny. And I had been keeping things light because it made me feel calm. As I came upon the steps up the sidewalk to 100 East Walton Street, my building, another lone car came around the corner of the alleyway from across the street from next to Bloomingdale's parking lot. Like the first ramming car, it was going the wrong way toward Runway Street. The car sped down Walton Street and rammed into the large plain pane glass window, which was directly across the street from where I was standing. Oh my God, there's another car, I said to my friends calmly. And there it goes. Oh, it rammed into the window of Bloomingdale's. What? Oh, you heard that. Well, I wish you could see what I'm seeing, you guys. There's like about a hundred people that just came around running from out of the alley. Yeah, at least a hundred. No, no, maybe 55. I don't know. Now they're going into Bloomingdale's. Yeah, dudes, I'm not joking. But it is funny. Why didn't the first car drive into the window? That guy was so stupid. What? I'm fine. Oh, I'm good. It's not like I'm standing there filming them. Then they might come after me if I was filming them. If I was filming them, they would think I was, you know, TikToking. Hey, just go in. He's wondering if he should go into the store. Dude, just run in. Snatch up a few designer purses and run the fuck away. People are so stupid. I know, right? Oh, you, oh, you mean me? Wait a minute. Oh, I hear something. Okay, wait, shut up. I'll tell you. Wait, I hear something, you guys. Shh. 
what I was hearing is this boom, boom, boom above my head. And I thought it was gunshots at first. And so I said, nope, nope, it wasn't gunshots. It's just my doorman. He's banging on the window. I, I think he's trying to scare off the looting people. He's he's yelling. What? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's yelling at me, you guys. Hi. <laughs> Oh, hi. Yeah. Yeah. You guys, I got to go. I'm fine. Fine. My doorman just wants me to come in. Okay. I'll call you guys later. I'm going to go on Twitter to see if this is, see if this is just happening here. And then I hung up as my doorman pulled me into the building and locked us in. And I did go on Twitter that night and I saw the footage of the lootings that happened that night across the city, but none of that compared to seeing it all in person. I drank the two bottles of wine left by my client guests and I ate the rest of their warm cheese and crackers for dinner and I went to bed. I probably passed out. The next morning as I walked around my neighborhood, I cried. Many people inspecting the damage and watching the boarding up companies patch up the broken shop windows were also crying. Many of us took pictures, but you couldn't capture the devastation, the destruction. How do you take a picture of human disgust and despair? I could not measure at that time how much the cost of the lootings would impact the city of Chicago or me. And I could not have known that soul jarring is for me. And I could not have known that soul jarring experience was only the first of many to come that I would experience firsthand again and again. But I'll have to tell you those stories that were the country western sock of my life these past few years and more about Megumi and other wonderful people who were important in my life in later episodes. Thanks for listening. New episodes drop most every Monday. To know more about me, John David, or read my books, as well as listen to the podcast episodes of Mafia Hairdresser, The Glow Stick Gods, John David and Goliath, or more episodes of How I Killed My Mother, just go to MafiaHairdresser.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment at will. I am Mafia Hairdresser on social media.